I don't know if it's, um, you're sick of hearing Dave guilt trip you every Sunday to come on Wednesdays, or if you really want to come hear Gigi because she's always so good. <laughs> both. Both. both, both, right? <laughs> so last week, I know mom was going to take down the kids and sit in the nursery. They're streaming down there, so I don't know if they left already. Did they go, Jasmine? They're yeah. good? Okay. So last Wednesday, we have everything on YouTube and a podcast. If you missed it, Mom did uh, broke down chapters in Leviticus 22 through 24. Let me tell you, some of the new or the Old Testament can be tough to read. So the way you guys are breaking down these chapters and what the Lord is giving you has been really good, really good. So thank you. Um, it just shows that. Um, God shows people different things in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I actually had some stuff I was going to talk about last week, but Mom said that she has way too much to talk about, so I saved it for this week, which maybe it's good because there's so many people here. Um, it led me to my next thought. Um, but I was doing a devotional last week, and this just really resonated with us, or resonated with me. Um, it was about gifts. And none of us should think that we're not gifted. Because according to Romans 12, 7 through 21, we all have different gifts according to the grace he gives us. These gifts build up the church, but they must be used efficiently and effectively. You must realize that all the gifts and abilities come from God. Also understand that not everybody has the same gifts as you. And I know that um, you can struggle with that. You can be like, oh, they, they do so good at that. How do they do that? But little do you know that you're just as effective in your gift yes. as they yes. are, right? So you just, have, you just have to be able to realize that everything comes from God and understand that you don't have the same gifts as them. Yes. Be sure not to hold back. 1 Timothy 4.14 tells us, don't ne neglect your gift. But if we use ours, however small and simple, for his glory, it'll start developing into a blessing for all. But, Jenny, how do you realize what our gifts are? Well, if you guys look in the Bible in Romans 12, verse 7. Now, I don't know this stuff, you guys. I can't just throw verses out there. This is where the studying comes in, right? And just Googling and looking things up. That's how easy it is. If something drops in your mind or your heart or your spirit, you just start looking it up. Thank God for Google. In Romans 12, verse 7, it starts listing the gifts. It's, it's serving, let them serve. If it's teaching, let them teach. If it's encouraging, let them encourage. If it's contributing to the needs of others, let them contribute and give generously. Yes. Mm -hmm. If it's leadership, let them govern diligently. And if it's mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Yes. Now, these lists are gifts that just imagine all of the people who have all these. Mm -hmm. When you know what your gift is, how can you use it to build up God's family? Just think about all of your gifts can't do the work alone. We have to be thankful that everyone's is different. Yeah. It's kind of like that saying, right? Your weakness is somebody else's strength. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember the Bible also says each one of us has one body with many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are from one body, the members belong to all the others. Right. This is how we build the church. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start claiming our gifts and using them powerfully and responsibly for God's glory. Yeah. And maybe this is for myself because I think I'm supposed to be this really smart, what do we call it, Vicki, uh, a Bible bookworm? I am not. But I love hanging out and talking with people, so maybe that's what I think my... Yeah. My right. gift, my gift right. is right. I'm yes. not. I can't be. I'm not a Bible bookworm. I can't retain information. But I have all the people around me who can help with that. Right. So that was my uh, opening for today. So let's pray for Gigi as she does Leviticus. Um, she's doing 25 through 27, right? Okay. Lord, thank you, thank you for bringing us here tonight. And that um, you've brought all these visitors, Lord. It's so good to see people yes. wanting to come and learn your word, Lord. I pray that you would have your hand upon Gigi, Lord. Take away the, uh, the nervousness, Lord, because she's really good at, at, at what she does up here, Lord. So I pray that she would present all of her information that you gave her in a way that we can receive it. Have your hand upon her and upon everybody here and the kids downstairs. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 
Well, good evening, everyone. Praise the Lord. Um, I wasn't expecting such a big crowd, so uh, <laughs> I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous, but, uh, but praise God for everyone who's here tonight as I go through Leviticus 20 through through 27. Uh, I was actually rescheduled to teach today, and when I looked at the date, I realized that it's a few days after what was three years since I first stepped into Angel and David's home wow. um, and back really into a new life with Christ in 2021. Um, as I reflected on it, though, the Lord brought me back to a memory that I had forgotten about from 2020, when during the COVID shutdown, I was watching a series on Jenny Rivera. Uh, she was a Mexican-American singer killed in a plane crash who had a very tragic life. At the time, what stood out to me about the series was not just the tragedies of her life, though. As an unbeliever, I was struck by her family's part of the story and their coming to the Lord. Her brother, who was an alcoholic on a drinking binge, stumbled upon a church and walked into it. That moment changed his and his family's life forever as they so slowly started coming to the Lord also. I remember thinking during that time how beautiful the feeling must be to go to church and have those feelings of peace. But my thoughts were soon overshadowed by the thinking that I could not follow Christian rules. Could I really change like that and give up the life that I was leading? Which, let me tell you, was not very good at all. But my things were worldly things. Things were normal, that were normal to the worldly standards. My blinded views of the world and the cans and the can and op dues of the Christian life stopped me at that moment from doing something that seemed so beautiful to me. Or they just gave me excuses. How do you change something when wrong seems so right for everyone else? I mean, you know it's wrong, but everyone else does it. So if it's right for them, then why is it not right for me? But it's not that hard to change when you want to. When you experience a love so great like the love of God, it transforms you even when you don't realize it. Fast forward to when I walked into David and Angel's home. I was in desperate need of saving, so I forgot the rules I had conjured up in my head just a year before to believe were some of the reasons that held me back. I gave myself to the Lord and he slowly transformed me. The love God has for us and the loving relationship we have with him not only frees us from the life we had in the past, he changes your want to do it, your likes, your dislikes. Yes. David and Angel did not give me a handbook created by man on the do's and don'ts of Christian living. They gave me a Bible, the handbook authored by God himself. Yes. The word is God's handbook on how to live and apply his standards on a life lived in obedience to him and in a way that pleases him as a forgiven person. Yes. God worked on me then and still works on me every day. Amen. The book of Leviticus was written for the people of Israel as a handbook on how to live as forgiven people right. and apply the standards they did not have in the pagan lifestyle they were surrounded by in Egypt. They did not know the moral rules because they did not have any, just like I didn't have any before I came to Christ. The laws gave them structure on how to act and worship God, remembering all the things he had done for them. But it also set them apart, just like Julie said two weeks ago. It made them holy, which is what God wanted for his people. While the book of Exodus spoke about what God led the people out of, Leviticus talks about what God is leading his people into a life full of his presence with their obedience in him. Very good, yeah. The word holy in Hebrew means set apart for a specific purpose. I found it interesting that the definition in Merriam-Webster dictionary states, exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. God did not want his people perfect. He wanted them to be set apart from the pagans and their lifestyle to reflect his goodness in all they said and did. If they followed the laws, they would reflect his character, the same he wants for us. Spiritual laws are not so we are perfect. God forbids us to do certain things because he wants us to be like him, not be him. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 25, 2 through 5. Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you have entered the land I am giving you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath rest before the Lord every seventh year. For six years, you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year, the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. 
Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that year. And don't store away the crops that grow on their own or gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. The land must have a year of complete rest. God thinks very highly of rest, so much so that he put it in the Ten Commandments, commandments to observe a day of rest, and then he instructed the Israelites to give a year of rest to the land every seven years. It sounds like a lot of rest, but there's so much more to this instruction. All the people had in Egypt was work, 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 and probably from sunrise to sundown. Never a moment to stop and enjoy the fruits of their labor. But God did. He rested on the seventh day after creating the world and made it holy, set apart from the other days of work. He created the Israelites in his likeness, and his instructions to them were to also set apart days and years as holy, to not only rest, but to be in obedience to him. In my previous Bible study on Exodus, I explained, and you can go back to that if you like to so on YouTube, I explained that this obedience to his commandment was to, not just, was to not worship other idols, but God himself. Work, success, and money were idols then just as they can be now. God wants us to restore and refresh by, re by resting in him with our faith. Resting causes people to pause and reflect. And God wanted his people to take the time of rest to reflect on all he had done for them, bringing them out of Egypt. They were slaves and they were now set free. The Lord wants the same for us. We were once slaves to sin and now we're set free. Yes. That is why it is so important to spend time with the Lord. The amount of time is not the issue, but making the time of just you and him to pause and not just give him a to-do list, but to pause and reflect on all the good things he has done in your life how we were once slaves to sin and now set free, and to thank him for it. Amen. Leviticus 25, 21 through 22. Be assured that I will send my blessing for you in the sixth year, so the land will produce a crop large enough for three years. When you plant your fields in the eighth year, you will still be eating from the large crop of the sixth year. In fact, you will still be eating from that large crop when the new crop is harvested in the ninth year. Israel was an agricultural society. Their lives and their families' lives were dependent on the land for their livelihood. So the people had to trust God completely that their livelihood would be sustained in that seventh year. God promised them that they would be provided for. All they had to do was trust in him and their word. Chapter 25, verses 8 through 22, describes the year of the Jubilee, which means ram's horn trumpet. God tells Moses that the people must count off seven sets of seven years, and then the following year on the Day of Atonement, they were to blow the ram's horn loud and long throughout the land. Now, if you do not read before tonight, you can't do the math in your head, seven sets of seven years is 49 years. So the 50th year was a jubilee year to be kept as holy. And again, there would be no planting of fields, gathering of vines, or storing of crops. They could eat whatever their land, the land produced on its own. Leviticus 25, 13. In the year of Jubilee, each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors. God instructs the people that on the year of the Jubilee, land that was previously sold went back to the original owners. When the people came into the Promised Land, portions of the land was designated to tribes and their families. What God gave to them was to belong to their families forever. That meant that if at any point they were without land due to circumstances, they would get their land back and be able to start over. Yes. God not only gave the people their land back, but any Israelites who had become slaves were now set free and debts were canceled. It was a year of liberty for the Israelites. Mm -hmm. According to the Webster Dic Dictionary, liberty is the state of being free. According to the Oxford Dictionary, it is a state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. I never really focused on the word liberty until pastor started saying, mentioning it a couple times during services. I always thought of it used in terms of warring countries or people declaring freedom in a turbulent country, but I never really thought of it being applied to my life. Then I realized a life of sin is turbulent and in a war with the enemy who wants to control our lives. But Jesus came to save us from that. Romans 6, 7, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Luke 4, 16 through 21. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath, 
and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes were in the synagogue looking at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. These verses from Luke are often called Jesus' mission statement as he declared himself the Jubilee, his reason for taking human form. The Jubilee year was the year of the Lord's favor, but Jesus was proclaiming the time of the Lord's favor had come once and for all. Jesus came here to give us that state of being free, to give us liberty from the oppression of sin and the views of what normal is in this world. For the Israelites, the year of Jubilee was a reset to bring them back to God and the creator and giver of all things. Jesus fulfilled the, the Jubilee, giving us the option to reset when we are baptized in water and in spirit. Amen. With his spirit inside of us, we can reset with him every day when we repent for our sins and ask for his forgiveness. God's intention from the beginning has always been grace and restoration for his people. God, just, just as the Jubilee was about God feeding and nour nourishing the people of Israel, we are to have faith and let Jesus feed and nourish us with his word, trusting him to take care of all of our needs. Leviticus 26, 9. I will look favorably upon you, making you fertile and multiplying your people, and I will fulfill my covenant with you. Chapter 26 starts out with God instructing the people again to not set up carved images, sacred pillars, and sculptured stones to worship them, and to also keep the Sabbath days of rest holy. He explains how they need to follow his commands, and in turn, he will bless them, because he will honor the covenant relationship with them. We probably say the word covenant all the time in Bible studies and sermons on Sundays, because it is an important word. The covenants made with Noah, Abraham, Israel, David, and ultimately Jesus are the backbones of the Bible. Covenants are binding contracts, but they are relational and personal, not like a business contract, but a loving partnership. They have standards that both parties have to keep. Most of us think of marriages when we think of covenants. While I can't wait to get married in June and look forward to my honeymoon in Tennessee, there is more to the covenant relationship that I'm about to commit myself to. There is work and standards as I have to apply it to my life when I become a wife. This is like the standards applied to the Israelites when they were in covenant with the Lord. God was telling them that he was going to fulfill his part of the covenant, but they needed to do the same. Yeah, yeah. Leviticus 26, 12 through 13. I will walk among you, I will be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, so you would no longer be their slaves. I brought the yoke of slavery from your neck, so you can walk with your heads held high. God is reminding the Israelites to always remember what he did and respect what he did for them as yeah. part of their covenant. Yeah. He will honor his part of the covenant with them by bringing them blessings that he promised them. Now, if they do not honor their part of the covenant, <coughs> then what is described in the next part of chapter 26 is quite graphic. God describes diseases brought on them, crops failing, and they're being defeated by the enemies. He tells them that they will run even when no one's chasing them and their crops and their livestock will be no more, leaving them no choice but to ration their food and go hungry. Mm -hmm. Leviticus 26, 18. And if, in spite of all of this, you still disobey me, I will punish you seven times over for your sins. Mm -hmm. Actions are activities, and consequences are the outcome. We teach our children that their words and behaviors are their actions, but if they don't say the right things or behave the right way, then there will be consequences. The Israelites had come from an environment in Egypt where the people could live with performing actions of all kinds of lust, idol worshiping, and lives center centered around themselves with pride and greed without caring about consequences. An environment of no moral code and living for themselves because everyone else did so. Unfortunately, it describes a lot of how people live today. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 11. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, 
Shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the Father of our spirits and live forever? God is not a dictator or a tyrant bark barking orders at us for obedience, but he is a loving father. And just like we should obey our earthly fathers, we should be even more obedient to him. As a parent can take an iPad or something else a child loves in order to discipline them, consequences can mean taking away the things we think we love or we think we need more than God. What did the people of Israel have that God had to take away when they were being disobedient? Their land, which meant their money and their success, and their pride. God was letting them know he was taking away the things they were loving or thought they needed more than him when they weren't doing the things that he asked. Leviticus 26, 25. I will send armies against you to carry out the curse of the covenant you have broken. When you run to your towns for safety, I will send a plague to destroy you there and you will be handed over to your enemies. God was very specific that the people of Israel should honor their part of the covenant they made with God. It was a binding covenant. Like I said previously, it was relational, but not a servant-slave type of relationship. The slave just obeys to not get severely punished. No, this, this I mean relational, relational is the, in the way that the Lord wanted his people closer to him, just like a father pulls his children closer to him. The Lord did not want to punish the people because of his anger towards them, but because of his anger towards sin. Sin takes his people away from him. When we reject the word and the things God convicts us from, to hold us back from, we are rejecting the direction and, and protection he has promised in our lives. God intended for us to be like him, but it's not always easy. Following rules is easier when you want to. And then there's times when you say, God, do I really have to do that? I wanted to be free from the torment of alcoholism, so when I gave myself to the Lord, it was an absolute miracle that I was freed, but my heart was willing. Yet there were, and there still are, other things that my flesh did not want to give up. My inability to let others help me, or lack of communication, you can ask John about those things, or being up here and speaking, because I get tongue-tied just saying a prayer out loud to people. But just as I am about to get married and enter into a covenant with John, vowing to work on letting him help me more, not completely, I'm working on it, and communicating with him more, I am in a relationship with God first and work every day on all the things that I let him, that I ask him to let me see. Rules that my spirit should follow, but my flesh refused to acknowledge until the day I walked into Angel and David's home in 2021. God's rules are not chains to bind us like sin did, anchoring us down, but to free us from those weights to live a life of love honoring him. Remember, God's intention is for us to be like him. So spiritual laws may not always be easy, but his intention has nothing to do with our comfort, but our character. Leviticus 26, 40. But at last, my people will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors for betraying me and being hostile toward me. Leviticus 26, 44. But despite all this, I will not utterly reject or despise them while they are in exile in the land of their enemies. I will not cancel my covenant with them by wiping them out, for I am the Lord their God. The Lord is a just judge, and he has to judge the evil he hates. But God's favor was still on the lives of the Israelites. He was letting them know that with God, there's always a way back with a repentant heart. Even at their worst, God would not break his covenant with the Israelites. People may forget him, and they want to live their worldly ways, but he's always willing to give life no matter how close to sin and death we get. We just have to be willing to repent. God's ultimate act of mercy and forgiveness was to come in human flesh down to this earth. A version Bible plan devotional states he was the final offering, the final day of atonement, and the ultimate covenant keeper. When the Pharisees questioned Jesus about religious law, his answer to them in Matthew 22, 37, 40 was, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Yes. This is the first and greatest commandment. Yes, A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. The entire law and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus' answer to the Pharisee, Pharisees reveals the heart of God from when he gave the laws to Moses. And it is the basic yet important principle of the basis of his relationship with us. 
Jesus did away with the strict rules of the laws of Leviticus, but he brought light to the foundation of what God meant when he gave those rules to Moses. He wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, and mind, because out of those three come our emotions, actions, and thoughts. When our hearts, souls, and minds are on him, it is reflected in our emotions, actions, and thoughts, resulting in the pure relationship with, with him that he wants. Even when we stray away, and no matter how bad things get, we can always reach out for his hand. Because Jesus took on those curses from Leviticus when he died on the cross. We are still to be obedient and to be disciplined when we are not. But because God is still a loving father, with repentance we can be brought back to his loving arms forever. We may lose faith sometimes, but God always remembers his promises he made to us. Yeah. 2 Th Timothy 2.11 This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Chapter 27 is about the Israelites making vows for extra dedications to the Lord. The Israelites were required to dedicate certain things to the Lord, like their firstborn sons, first harvest, and firstborn animals. A lot of times people wanted to dedicate in addition to what was required. So they would dedicate themselves, their family members, additional animals, homes, land. God had indicated that money could be substituted as, symb as symbolism in the dedication's place. God did not want just the rich to ma make dedications to him though. So he instructed the priest to take into account the financial ability of the person. God also put a penalty on buying back their dedications to make the people think twice about making rash, deci rash decisions and unrealistic expectations when making vows. Making a vow to the Lord was not to be taken lightly. It is the highest form of devotion that a person could make to God. When we think of vows in modern day society, we think of wedding vows, which unfor unfortunately are not always taken seriously considering the high rate of divorce. We live in a world where a promise in any area of life could be strong and then the next day it could be broken and it's okay. The person left with the broken promise just has to deal with it. It is just so normal to not stand on convictions and not honor commitments when things get too hard or don't go our way. God's word though is full of promises and he always keeps his promises to us. Out of our love for him and the intention to be in his likeness, we are to keep our word as well. Jesus paid for the cost of our broken vows and gave us the comfort that he will never break his vows to us. God only wants us to make vows we are going to keep. He does not require us to make them, so it's better not to make a vow to him or to anyone at all than to make one with the possibility of not keeping it. Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5. When you make a promise to God, don't delay in following through, for God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep all the promises you make to him. Yes. It is better to not say nothing than yes. to make a promise and not keep it. Yeah. Matthew 5, 37. Just a simple yes I will or no I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. <laughs> Leviticus 27, 34. These are the commands that the Lord gave through Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. This last verse of Leviticus applies to the whole book. In summary, it is a book of no moral binding commands, sometimes ceremonial, that would seem to apply to just the Jewish people. But it also has so much spiritual meaning for us that our teachers broke down every Wednesday as they went over Leviticus, showing the relation to Jesus and to our lives as Christians. We learned about God's character and how he wants our character to reflect his. Yes. We may not be under the law of Moses with ceremonial, off ceremonial offerings and obligations, but we are still under the basic important laws of the Lord, which he created to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. God has not changed, and just like these principles apply to the Israelites as back then, they still apply to us now. Yes. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, everyone. Good job, God's really using these girls, eh? They're right. doing a great job. Amen. You know, I, uh, I'm so happy to see Carter here. Right. I got to remind Carter, Carter's an infant. Right. You are. 
According to the Word of God, that's what you are. Right? I remember uh, Pastor, my pastor, Frank, uh, I think he was 43 years old. Well, when he was baptized, God saw him as a one-day-year-old. One-day-year-old. And when you got to, sometimes we've got to tell the Lord this, God, I'm only, I'm only a month, you know, <laughs> right? A month-year-old can get away with stuff that me, after 40 years, I can't get away with, right? Which is, it should be that way, right? I'm more educated, I should understand better, but do you know it's possible that you could be 40 years old in the Lord, but God could see you only as a five-year-old? I have an uncle like that. He's the same age as I am, but he his mindset is as a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. But do you think that God loves me more than him? No, right? Mm -hmm. God loves us all. But, you know, this. Uh, uh, did you see how she correlated Leviticus with today? Yeah. Right? right? Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Because it's... What, Leviticus is what? Types and shadows, right? Yes. So all those things we should be able to apply to our lives now. Yes. And I think that's so very important. A lot of people say, I can't understand it. Well, you know what? To get a book that you can understand and read it because those things can pertain to us today. You know, it's, it's so vital. It's so important and we, that we continue to grow. And, I, and also I wanted to make, say something. God has taken us to another level. Right. No, he is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid of it. Right? You, you ever finish up, like uh, my daughter's uh, learning a new job? Uh -huh. Well, you know what? They're preparing her to go the next step. Right. Our problem is we don't want to do the learning. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do the learning. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, once we have it, we become more valuable. Mm -hmm. Who wants to be more valuable, valuable to God? Yeah. Oh, I do. Right? right? Yeah. Well, then we have to take the learning on. Yeah. Okay? And so... Um, uh, I know that people don't like change. I'm talking about my Jenny. <laughs> but there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, God's the same yesterday, today, uh, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's going to take us to new levels. But understand, he's not going to do it in different ways. He's not going to become abusive now. You see, right? He's going to be as loving and kind as he takes us through every step. And I think that's so very important to understand. And, you know, uh, uh, I would close us in prayer, but I'm sort of, because uh, Vicki can sit right where she's at, and she's normally the one that always takes this mic, and I'm so happy to have her here today, right? Yes. But not only that, you know what? We have to continue to pray for her. Yes. yes. Amen. She's going through, it, it, it's more than spiritual, it's a physical, yeah, right, right. a physical, and you read about that, right? You read those things in the Bible, oh, man, I, I don't want to go through that. Right? Well, these things are happening, but she chooses to make the choice that I will be in service to the Lord. Amen. How much more should we not lift her up, pray for her, right? And continue to support her because she's going to be going through something. And you know what? I, we don't care how long. I know she's going to be standing up there again yes. doing what she always has done for us. Right? right? Yes. It's going to happen. We're just substitutes for now. But you know what? That's what we should do, right? We're the big brothers and the big, or the young brothers and young sisters, right? Okay? So we'll let Vicki close us. You can just sit right there, Vicki. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is good all the time, right? Yes, amen. Um, I do want to thank all of you for the prayers that you've had for me because they've been phenomenal. And I don't think... You know, for anybody who doesn't know, I've been through a surgeries that are that are failed, and I need to go through more, which is horrendous to think of. But you know, when you think about being lifted up in prayer by the people of God, there's nothing like it. You know, God's always good. Amen. Yeah. But and uh, just to correct Dave, I am going to be back in on May first. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, for a little while. For a little while. Later. I'm going to give Jenny a break, so, <laughs> for a little bit, but um, anyway, so, uh, thank you, Lord.